All right, it's uh, just a little bit after seven. We'll start this meeting of the uh, City of Kenmore Planning uh, Commission. First item of business is public comments. Do we have any residents caring to share any comments with us? I currently see no hands raised, but if we wanna give it a moment. Nope. Okay. Uh, we'll move on to our next item. Well, it says approval of minutes on the agenda. Uh, uh, however, I don't see any minutes specifically included there. Is that something we'll deal with in uh, December then, Rita? Yes, there'll be minutes for the December 7th meeting. Great. Okay, we'll move on to our next agenda item, which is the community forum debriefing. So invite Lori and Debbie to join us and uh, lead us away on that. <laughs> Well, good evening. Here we are again. Here we are again. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, this meeting was requested by the commission uh, to debrief on the forum, which, as you know, was held last Tuesday. I think we had a good attendance. We will not have the report from the consultants until December 7th, as we had previously mentioned. So uh, we will then be looking at their summary. We'll have access to the chat information, which we don't currently. Uh, we'll have the final versions of the uh, videos. Um, and so uh, at that point, staff may have some recommendations, policy recommendations, but we do not have that uh, tonight. We, one thing we are working on, uh, we've uploaded the PowerPoint presentations to our webpage on Missing Middle, and we are also working on a set of frequently asked questions that we will uh, link to that page to provide more information. So with that, I'll stop talking. And oh, except I will say, a similar format is being considered for next year's transportation element um, uh, project. So if you have specific questions about uh, or comments about how the form itself worked, that would be great information for us. So we can um, uh, let the consultant know it would be the same consultant working on the project next time. So. All right, so uh, debriefing. Now we have um, four of us here and we had what there were at least three different sections of that, right? Three or were there four? I, I was only in three myself, but um, there was vision, housing data definition and missing middle housing. Was there another the, breakouts? The fourth uh, breakout was for those using Spanish. And, oh, there, okay. uh, and so it was a kind of a compilation of all the information from the other rooms. There were no uh, attendees in that room. I do know that. Okay. Well, so one thought I had is maybe we could uh, just kind of, uh, uh, I think, I know all three of you, my colleagues were there, I, I, I saw you. Um, I thought maybe we could go through maybe each breakout session and share some thoughts that um, you might've had or things you heard from folks who were uh, joining that uh, breakout room. I know I know, kind of uh, there were different people there at different times, but um, how does that sound? Does that sound like a reasonable way to move forward. Okay, so let's see, why don't we start with the, the vision um, statement and anybody um, hear anything they wanna share or that they heard or that they wanna highlight from the vision um, segment of the... Um... Well, I'm, I'm real curious about how that worked out um, because I, I was in that room a couple different times and so the they would i think rita were you managing that one yeah so yes so uh, so you would scroll down a bit and people <laughs> would make changes and then it eventually you repeating the scrolling and the change making and um i know that there were folks on the call and they were in rooms at very sometimes the same time sometimes different who had diametrically opposed ideas about what the city should be doing. And so I'm real curious to know how that, um, the vision exercise went with um, making the changes, Rita, if, if um, how did, what did you end up with? <laughs> well, 
Um, yeah, I there was only a couple of people who gave some actual feedback to the actual questions, and then a lot of it was just people kind of giving um, feedback on other things. So, yeah, I, it I, it was a it was hard because apparently the chat did uh, followed you from room to room. So when you popped into a new room, you didn't see what was happening. You um. Sorry, let me. I forgot my camera was off. <laughs> um, you didn't see what was ha what had happened previously, and oh, um, there was some great questions in the chat. So I'm really happy that we were able to capture those questions. Um, so yeah, so that was one that was one big thing because um, some people like to open up, open it up on their own and we're viewing it on their own computer, but I think that only worked for the people who originally were there when I dropped it in the chat. So that was a little hard um, as people were popping in and out to to kind of catch them up to where we were. But yeah, as far as like feedback on the actual vision statement and the the things that that we were hoping to get answers on, um, there there was some, and and then mostly it was just kind of like an open conversation, which was really nice too. Yeah, I was in, I was in on that one for a fair amount of time. I and to to read his point about what uh, there was some good feedback. There were a couple specific things I heard that I thought were maybe worth bringing up here. One is um, there were a couple people who who wanted to include. Um, the term family friendly, and I don't recall exactly which bullet point that was uh, within the vision statement, but they thought that would be something that we should, I, I, I know we had a conversation about that and I, I know we um, took that one out in our preliminary versions, but I know there were at least two people who thought that should be um, considered for including. And there was another, um, I thought kind of interesting uh, back and forth about the word attractive. And I know we had quite a bit of back and forth about that one and I think, um, um, somebody had a, a good response that it's really hard to define that. So i um, not so sure about needing to do anything about that, but the family friendly one was, um, was interesting. Um, so anybody have any thoughts about, um, you know, that is potentially something to uh, reconsider. Um, Can I'm going to leapfrog over the family friendly issue for a second and, and speak to what you were I'm noticing Mark about attractive the conversation sure. and I, I noticed that too and I thought it was interesting and kind of mirrored the conversation we had amongst ourselves on the commission um, I noticed that there the, the point of view was expressed that you know don't, don't we all want our communities exactly. to be attractive yeah. and like isn't that something you know at a like at a high level visioning that we might aspire to. So I heard that. And then I also heard, well, what does that mean? What does attractive mean? That's so subjective. Like how, we, how can we objectify it? And so I, I heard both of those things. And I thought um, it, it made me feel like we're, we were on track as a commission with like, we were, rest, we're wrestling with, the, with, the, with that in a, in a very similar way as to the rest of the community. I don't have any you know, <laughs> way to wrap that up neatly, but I did notice it. Um, I also noticed in that room that people were calling out air quality as an important value for our community. Um, and it is, air quality is in our vision statement, um, but I think it surprised me a little bit because I hadn't thought about it in the same way that I heard this resident speak to it. And I, I heard her speaking to the fact that as we welcome more and more people into our city, as we become more dense, there will be more people who might enjoy burning things like wood in their fire pits in their backyards or in their wood burning fireplaces in their homes. And that will all, you know, have to think about the impacts of air quality about this. So I, I just hadn't thought about it in that way before. So that was interesting feedback for me to hear, even though we do have air quality in our, our vision statement. I think it's something I'll have to think about more carefully myself going forward. Um, about family friendly. Yeah, I don't know if I was in the room when that was talked about. Um, and maybe it's worth us revisiting as we move forward with the vision statement so we can um, flesh out our own thinking about it. What did the person or what did that resident say was what, what was the well he, he specifically one one it was two, two gentlemen one specifically mentioned you know the thought of uh, he really liked the idea of like his grandkids hanging out at the um, at the fountain there at the next to the hangar and, and, and in parks too. So he just had kind of had this 
vision of encouraging that as a you know a, a, a principal vision of what the city should uh, should aspire to. As I recall, and maybe um, uh, Mike and Suzanne can can add to this, but when we talked about family friendly, I think we were a little concerned that if we included that, you know, people who aren't necessarily part of I don't know, conventional families may feel kind of left out. That was one thing I remember from our mm -hmm. discussion. And I think that's at least partly why we at least preliminarily took that took that out. Um, Mike and Suzanne, do you, do you have any recollections of our discussion on that too? Yeah, I think you're right, Mark. Uh, as I recall, uh, the language that we looked at uh, was, uh, and the changes and the deletions were motivated the idea that we were, there was some concern I'm not sure it was expressed by everybody on the commission, uh, but some concern that using the word family uh, somehow might be a, a problem uh, in, in terms of inclusiveness. People might be concerned about that. Uh, obviously, that has been a longstanding value in, uh, in for Kenmore's vision in the past. So this is kind of a striking change. We don't have the word family. We struck the word family from the vision entirely. So I'm not surprised that there's some a negative reaction to that. Um, I think we ought to think a little bit more about are we overreacting uh, in the language that we have there, and, and maybe we ought to reconsider that. And particularly, mm -hmm. maybe we are, and I think we actually talked a little bit about this when uh, earlier, is we ought to maybe think about what is our definition of family, mm -hmm. and I, it, it, it's clearly changed over time. Family doesn't mean the same thing it did. You know, 50 years ago, 20 years ago. And, you know, I don't want to complicate our vision statement and make it any more wordy than it already is. But it's clear that the word family resonates with a lot of people. And maybe we ought to recognize that in the vision statement. And we can do that by actually maybe uh, saying really forthrightly that the definition of family has changed. And we continue our value of wanting to encourage and support families. But we're also want to, we want to make sure we're supporting the more modern current version of family, which is much more inclusive in definition uh, than it was in the past. Not that the prior definition was intended to be exclusive, but for change. So anyway, I'll stop on that. Yeah, I remember our discussion. I just didn't, oh, I'm getting some feedback there. That's better. Um, I just, I didn't get to hear what the person at the open house said. I want, but it sounds like perhaps that person was speaking to a value of kind of intergenerational connection, yeah, very um, much so. And all yeah. ages. So, I, and those are things that I maybe we could consider talking about, you know, families in our vision statement more that way. Yeah, I think that more inclusive approach, however it's it's phrased, is um, I think is is something worth revisiting. Um, I agree. I knew uh, there was also uh, someone who really uh, called out the vision and really and really liked it. Um, and there's also someone else who really liked the old style downtown <laughs> mentioned that, you know, the, I don't know if you heard uh, anybody else heard that, um, which apparently dates from the, the section, I guess, west of the post office, which dates to the World's Fair, which I personally didn't know that. So um, learn, learn something new every, uh, every day, huh? <laughs> so. Yeah, maybe the Heritage Society should see about making that a protected <laughs> <There you go. laughs> building. Yeah. <laughs> protected eyesore well debbie i think you you had a response to that right about uh, i think maybe that comment um i think what i said i was trying to tie it back to the vision statement and i think i tried to say whether um you know protecting or um, encouraging you know historical preservation conservation or something is something that is, is one idea that we could reflect in the vision statement or maybe um, see what policies are currently supporting historical preservation, conservation. Um, so that was sort of something that I, 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 you know, we can probably follow up on as well is how that should be addressed in the comp plan and if there should, it should be in the vision statement or if there should be a policy to address it. And there may already be one, I'm not sure. I did um, notice that you helped make that connection, Debbie, and I thought that was very, I, I appreciated it like in the moment as you were doing it, because I could see 
like how skilled you were at tying that person's feedback back to to our you know work like it was really good yeah but yeah. well, I, I would say, I mean, I think in, in the room, in that vision statement room, I think it was also an opportunity for people not only to comment on the direct language of the vision statement, but to also in general, either make general comments about questions or concerns that they had, some of which may or may not directly tie to the vision statement. So I think on December 7th, when we come back, you know, when we have more information um, you know, from the chat um, that we can then kind of bring back and maybe see if there's any of the questions or comments that were made that we feel are missing from the vision statement. But not everything, I think, is directly tied to that. So I think we just have to recognize that, um, you know, some people's comments might just be expressing, you know, what, what they envision or some of their concerns for the future. So, but I think we'll, we'll know more on December 7th. Well, anything, anything more anybody wants to share about, I guess, the vision um, breakout session, anything else that? I think um, if you don't mind, just two notes that I had were for a recreation slash community center that someone had brought up, maybe for G, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And then um, mental health and physical health was also um, brought up to maybe being added to um, F. So those are just, ah, yeah. Good, okay. Thank you, Rita. Yeah. yeah. I spent probably the most time in that room. I think, I'm not really sure why. I found the discussion in there pretty robust. I think people were feeling very comfortable um, sharing and I, I appreciated that. It was fun to listen in. So some of the other things that came, that came up in that room that I noted um, or that people were really concerned about are really concerned about infrastructure. Um, and we have definitely had those discussions as we've talked about missing middle housing on the planning commission. I heard people being concerned about safe spaces for pedestrians um, and some people called that out um, as sidewalks and some people just said, we need to think about how people can move around safely in our environment without mentioning how that would be um, I heard people talking about the need for um, parks as infrastructure, and I kind of am dumbtilling with the comment that Rita made, specifically calling out the need for as we grow as a city and as we become more dense, that we do need these like really robust places to gather as a community that are community spaces, not just commercial spaces, like a recreational center. Somebody mentioned a pool. I don't know if anybody mentioned ball fields in this meeting, but I do know that um, ball fields are a big um, desire for our community. So places like that, you know, where we can come together and play together seem to be really important for people as we are also growing. So as we, you know, gather more people, we, we need more places for those people to play together and recreate together. And the mental health came up too. I thought that was really interesting um, and a good point. Um, yeah, I think those are the things that I heard in that room trees people are concerned about trees we, we knew that too i'll just interject a general comment uh, i'm not sure that the breakout rooms work uh, as well as we would have hoped you know i've seen them in other settings where it works very well as generally when you have a, a a variety of different special interests in the group. And so people will gravitate to one, maybe two breakout sessions uh, over a broad, uh, a broader range of those. Uh, I, I tried to attend all of them, went back and forth, and often find myself more, coming into the middle of a discussion and, and having missed some, some important information or, or important comments earlier. So one of the things I'd think about maybe for the future, and we also had, I've noticed, <laughs> I have some pity for some of the monitors who seemed like every 15 minutes they were repeating the same introduction over and over again to the same, to a different set of two or three people who were there. Uh, several of the sessions had very large attendance, uh, but not all of them did. So I wonder maybe for the future, we would think about if we're gonna have a topic similar to this, that we would have some more of a sequential sort of uh, arrangement to this so people could hear everything and have everybody talking on the same subject at the same time. I think the, the interaction would have been a little bit more robust if we had 
Um, so I just throw that out there to be thinking about for the future. Thanks, yeah, Thanks, Jeff. Oh, great feedback. That's great feedback. Go ahead, Tracy. I was going to say, I liked the autonomy of being able to travel around, which is kind of mimics how it might work if you were in a physical space, you may be able to move around. Yeah. Um, and I didn't, I did enjoy that. Um, I can definitely, I hear Mike's point and I think that there is a lot of merit. We should think about that. It makes me think about the climate action plan open house that I attended just as a resident. Um, and maybe that's a different, it was run slightly differently and maybe that would be a good model for us to look at for our um, that future open house. I think they had presentations and then they had, people were put into breakout rooms, but they were like, we. I was with the same three other people each time we went into breakout room and we talked about, we had specific questions that we were talking about all together. So that could, that's just another model that I didn't have the ability to move around, which I really liked in this first one, but I, that might be a trade-off. I did find the conversation in um, the visioning statement pretty robust, and I did stay there for a long time, partly because of that. So I'm not really sure how it was in other rooms. Maybe it wasn't quite as robust. I don't know. Yeah, um, one uh, question, just a follow up, so I can we can talk with a consultant about it. So we had a discussion early on about whether we should have the presentations at certain times. So you would know, you know, the missing mill is going to be at seven and data and definitions is going to be at 715. And, uh, you know, we were, we talked about doing a schedule so people would know where they could join at the beginning of a presentation. And then um, uh, there, I think the consultants felt that we were kind of inhibiting the <laughs> flow of conversation. So then we went to that a looser format where we didn't have specific times. Um, any reactions to that part of it? Whether it was con confusing not to have a set schedule or, um, and, and certainly looking at the, I've heard a couple people mention the climate action open house. So we can look to that uh, as a potential model, but in this particular format, uh, Mike, I, Commissioner Vanderlyn, I'm interested in your idea of doing the sequential arrangement, but also wonder if it would have been helpful to have specific times noted for the discussions. Yes, I, in fact, that was kind of going through my mind as well. I think if you said if we gave specific times and people who were interested would know they could go there. If they weren't interested, they could leave or come back. Right, right. So I think that's a compromise to this. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have to compliment all of the facilitators. I think they did a really good job of trying to keep the conversation going and also had a good balance of how much time they were speaking versus encouraging other people to speak. And I think that's key. So I think if you had that and you had uh, a more consolidated uh, presentation and, and time, mm -hmm. I think you'd have more people in each one of these and, you, you, and if you have the time, you'd be sure to have people who are truly interested. And yeah. you wouldn't have people coming in and out or wouldn't have to come in and out and miss some of the earlier or later discussion. I think that was a, a little challenging. Um, I was in one room where they had just finished going through the slides and someone else came in and uh, the moderator didn't want to start the slides over yet because there was some other conversation. So there was just this kind of a herky jerky when you'd move between the rooms. Um, and you'd, you know, I, I think I saw, um, you know, the same portions of certain things over and over again, but missed out on the, the beginning or, or end. And then I agree that there's a lot of really good conversation and, um, and I think that, that that's limited by some, some of the schedule unless, yeah, unless it is a sequential kind of a thing where everybody moves and then maybe you have some discussion after that, I'm not sure. And I, the other thing I'd be interested in, there was um, one gentleman who, who was in a, a number of the rooms I was in and I was switching around. He was the, um, we need to bulldoze Kenmore and put up brownstones. I don't know if any of you, <laughs> the rest of you heard him. Yeah. Um, but occasionally what would happen is someone would, would um, 
kind of take over the conversation uh, with a very strong opinion and others wouldn't necessarily be able to express theirs. And then they'd go to the next room and ex you know, expound on that same notion. I think that's a good point, Suzanne. We need to figure out some way to gently constrain the conversation. You know, we have a three minute limit in public comment. We can't do that here because that's anathema to what we're actually trying to achieve. Yeah. But there were a number of folks who just couldn't stop talking. And there were a couple of sessions I was in where it was just a repeat over and over again and they, they ate up all the oxygen in the room. So I think that's a facilitation issue is how do we, what's the art, maybe our facilitators, our consultants can help us uh, learn how to do that. But how do we do that in a way that doesn't strangle the conversation, but leaves uh, enough air out there for, for other people to talk? And we don't get sidetracked on a single issue. Well, one of the things we do if we're meeting in person is uh, like an open house format, we would have what we call a floater. And that person then is, if there is somebody that is taking up a lot of time, that person then would be directed to the, the staff person who's the floater person to have more of a one-on-one a -on -one conversation so that they can still talk, but it, it opens up the conversation to other folks. Um, so thinking about that in an online format is a little more challenging to do, but it's certainly possible. Um, so I think that's something to, to be aware of. Um, I think we can also sort of sort of maybe, uh, you know, sort of announce, and I think we try to do that a little bit, that, you know, to try and let everybody speak and, and um, you know, sort of so, so gently allow somebody to, to not speak. It, it's really hard because, you know, you don't want to cut somebody off. You don't want to make somebody feel that they're not being heard. So it, it, it is trying to find that fine balance. And it's certainly a little more challenging in an online format. Yeah. Those are those are a lot of really good points. And one thing I think um, I think I think this was done at least to some extent was um, the the actual presentations I think were were posted or or tried to be posted in the chat room. I think I saw that at least in in one. I think there was an effort to do that. So that might be I don't want to overcomplicate this, but that might be another way to allow people who are, who weren't there for whatever you know time the presentation was made to at least see the the slides. I know it is hard online trying to you know trying to manage all these um, you know these trade-offs as it has been mentioned but um, yeah again I want to uh, also echo what Tracy said I thought all the all the moderators all the moderators did a really nice job at uh, kind of balancing uh, presenting the information and, and encouraging conversation so I can't imagine anybody left feeling not heard that's I would I would <laughs> I would definitely say that <laughs> sure so, Lord. Uh, yeah. so one thing that we noticed after the forum we had a little 15 minute debriefing after the event itself just to sort of talk about technical issues. And one thing we noticed was that it appeared that a person's chat followed along with the person. So what was happening was if people were posting things in a room in the chat, uh, it didn't appear in the chat of the person who just joined the room. Um, because the chat, it, did you all notice that the chat was following you? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. We, we needed to confirm that, but that's sort of a technical glitch um, that we'll have to talk about and figure out if there's a better way to manage it. Yeah, I, I was just reflecting on how perhaps a person's temperament or personality might play into how they experience this event, because I actually... I kind of liked it. I like, I mean, but I kind of like to be able to travel around and just listen in and not feel pressured to. <laughs> and here I was there mostly to listen, so that's an, also another difference between me and my experience there and, and a resident who was there to really share their views. Um, but I, um, I would like to, I guess I would be really interested to hear, like I'm interested in how we experienced, but I'm also really interested in how our community experienced it. You know, the people who were the residents who came, like what was their perception? How did it work for them? You know, as I, it, maybe it would be similar to what we're hearing here amongst ourselves, or maybe it would be, would be different because I don't think that there, I, I don't think there was anything inherently broken about what we did. Um, I think that there were imperfections because this is a new zoom world that we're all learning how to navigate but I, I didn't feel like it was 
I felt like there were a lot of successes. And I was getting like notifications at the top of my screen about like in, in five minutes, they're going to start the presentation again in a different room. I don't know if everybody else was getting those, but like, that was a cue to me that, oh, like if I wanted to go back to see that presentation, I could move, you know, that was a nice prompt, I thought. And also like when I was moving around, I did come in at like the end of the pre of presentation. So I didn't hear the whole thing, but I stayed for the kind of chat. And then they said, we'll be starting this presentation over. So I just hung out in that room and, I, and then I, so I could hear the whole presentation. And then I, you know, I left. So I found ways to make that part work for me. Um, I think the nice thing about doing it that way too, is that somebody could come, how, our open house was two hours, is that right? So somebody could come for an hour, but they can, they could still experience all the rooms and all the topics, and then they could leave, you know, you didn't have to be there for the whole time to get to, to hear everything. Um, I'm not necessarily arguing for this format. I'm just trying to think of like what some of the strengths were um, so that we, you know, could carry those strengths forward, even as we changed format. And I did really appreciate, this was in um, the visioning vision statement room and Rita was was moderating. She did a great job. Um, but somebody did speak at length about, oh, which is probably something also I should bring up, uh, all the, the contaminants that are in some of our properties that we hope to redevelop. Um, and she did have a fair amount to say, but I think it was it was a wonderful space to hear that, for, for our community to hear that and for her to be able to say it. Um, because like so often we are constrained by like the, the formality of the, you know, three minute comments at council and our three minute comments here to planning commission. So I feel I feel like the openness of the space felt really good to me. And I, I hope that that felt good for people who were participating as well. And I don't, I guess like I wasn't in other rooms, like I didn't hear the brownstone. Um, it sounded like almost it was maybe a speech or something. <laughs> so I missed that part. So maybe, you know, maybe it did become more overbearing in other rooms. I'm not sure. Um, but again, like I, I hope that we could carry forward like the, the spaciousness and the openness for people to be able to just share without feeling like they had a timer. <laughs> it can be kind of stressful sometimes. One other thing maybe to think about for the future is, uh, I, I agree, it'd be really nice to have, had, to have some feedback from the citizenry who were there. And one way to collect that, and I've seen in, in similar formats, is to ask some questions, uh, either periodically within the session or at the end of the session. You can ask some pretty innocuous questions, such as, uh, "Does this vision statement uh, meet your your vision for Kenmore?" And you know, rate it one to five, and see how after people have had a chance to ask some questions and talk about it, see what they have to say about it. Particularly seeing we've got a pretty good baseline in the, in the current survey that we did just a while, a little while ago. But so you don't want to overdo it, but one or two questions uh, within the session to kind of get a sense of uh, what people's reaction were. And uh, in my mind, a big part of the reason or the value in uh, uh, this last session was to provide education to folks. I mean, a lot of people didn't really go in understanding fully uh, what we were thinking about here. So they had an opportunity to learn that. So it'd be interesting to ask some questions to see, okay, do you feel better informed? Uh, you know, what's your level of concern? How do you feel about the future of Kenmore after having listened here? Things like that to give us a general sense of, of whether we're moving the needle in the right direction or not. I don't know if you can attach some kind of a survey um, at the end when people are on their way out, they could choose whether or not to do the survey and maybe win a gift card to Diva Coffee. So there should have been, and I'm, I'm feeling a little alarmed because there was a survey that was supposed to pop up whenever anybody left hmm. the event. And it's sounding like maybe that did not happen. Did you all? I got I one. Agree. This is Rita. I, I got one when I logged off of the meeting, which was interesting because I was logged in as a co-host so yeah so it's sounding like i i think i saw that too but uh in all in full honesty i didn't um i didn't fill it out so okay <laughs> it, it mostly it didn't actually uh ask content about like missing middle or the vision statement it asked demographic information which we were trying to use to judge whether we were reaching um 
a broad swath of the community. Uh, and then there were a couple of questions right at the end that said, do you feel better informed about this topic? Uh, generally, not specifically related to, um, uh, again, the substance of the meeting. So I think I hear that two of you think you saw the survey, the other folks and Rita saw the survey. I didn't see the survey when I logged off. I don't know. No. Right. So maybe you've mentioned something about it frequently in the various rooms so people are yeah, aware of right. it. Right. But I know there some folks are not so familiar with uh, Zoom or being in in the rooms, and so they may not have recognized what it what it was, or who knows. I've been fearful of it. You know, one of the things to keep in mind is, particularly if you put the survey at the end, at the end of any one of these things, you've got a stampede to get out, and so people's attention span has already been eaten up. So it, it's probably not a good time to ask them for one more thing. Uh, but, you know, that's why I think it's interspersing a question or two, which they, you can get the response to right there uh, online and feed it back to people to tell them, hey, this is what you're telling us. And it, you know, it helps reinforce the whole, uh, the whole discussion. Yeah, we do, we do actually, for our work, we do conferences, virtual conferences, and we send out, um, surveys but we we wait till uh after it's over and have people go to a website to kind of fill out the information so there's a lot of ways to do it but i agree right after may not be the you know the optimum time even though people are you know we it's kind of fresh in their mind they may just not have the energy or interest to fill it out at that time i don't you don't i don't, I don't people did do people have to register with email addresses for this I, i'm sorry i can't recall or they could just show up right I think you had to register, and I assume that you email address was part of it to get the link. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so maybe that's one access point to have you know information to send out a follow up. Survey. Right. Right. And we'll again have more details: how many people, what was in the chat, all that kind of thing uh, at your next meeting. I think that's related to a, a question I was just thinking of, Lori. Is what, what, will we get a Will there be kind of an analysis of the qualitative analysis of, of what was said, like the topics that were brought up and the frequency yeah. with which things like that? Yeah, we're um, uh, we're working. I'm not sure like the frequency of topics, but we all individually were writing sort of summaries from our rooms and key points that we heard. And certainly this information that you're providing mm -hmm. um, can be incorporated into that. So we will have kind of a summary of the event. We'll know how many people actually attended, mm -hmm. um, et cetera. Yeah, I know we were kind of got, have gotten away from the content a little bit and they're talking about the structure, but I did just want to make sure that I say, like I, I did hear, you know, a range of like, opinions about missing middle housing, everything from like, I don't know what this is. Can you explain it to me? To um, this is a horrible idea. Don't put this anywhere in Kenmore. We need, you know, we need to focus on affordable housing, you know, at the very, very low income levels. To this is a great idea. I think the Planning Commission is doing a very good job considering this and talking about it. To like, we just have to go full on to higher density housing all over. Like, it was a really interesting to hear a whole range of opinions. And I just wanted to say that I, I heard all that. Um, and yeah, I will be thinking about that. <laughs> How to make sense of it, I don't know. <laughs> well, maybe that's a perfect segue to, yeah, just um, any, any, those are really good good thoughts, Tracy. I, I heard a lot of those same things too in the missing middle. I think the housing data definition, it kind of um, you know overlapped in the missing middle as well. So maybe we can sort of combine those and um, uh, you know, anyone else want to share some thoughts on, on you know, specific things they heard? Um, in either missing middle or housing data definition. Um, yeah, go ahead, Mike. Yeah, as I'm sure you folks are aware, who've been around and heard me long enough, I've never really been a huge fan of ADUs, but I had an interesting, I wouldn't quite call it an epiphany, but a light bulb went off, listening to a number of the older uh, residents uh, who were talking about the fact that they were living in a large home, which had been their family home, and they were either 
deal with their with their family member, uh, husband or wife, or by themselves. And they were basically staying in the house because it was the cheapest housing available to them. Uh, they were their preference was to downsize in some way, when, and they would be very willing, to, uh, from what, what I heard, uh, to to sell their house and move on. But there's no place, particularly Kenmore and even beyond, for them to go and get that, or at least there's a shortage of it. On the other side, uh, flip side, I heard a lot of younger uh, residents. Uh, who are sitting on big mortgages right now, or they're trying to figure out how to fund their kids' education or their own retirement. And uh, they have large lots and could have, would be willing to invest in an ADU. Uh, that the older residents who want to get out of large houses would, would really like to have. So we've got a, a willing market. We've got uh, an investor population who would love to be part of that. What's missing is the connection between the two of them, which is the financing. Uh, it's almost impossible to get a good financing for, for an ADU investment. Um, and that really has created a, a market dysfunction. Uh, you know, the system isn't working uh, because it ought to be. Uh, there ought to be financing available uh, to make this work. Uh, and it, it's nonsensical that it isn't. I mean, you've got folks out here who are potentially cash rich uh, who would would love to put money up front if that guaranteed them uh, an ADU you know, type of arrangement that they could they could move into. Uh, and simultaneously as they did that, that would help uh, alleviate some of our, our, our housing needs here. I'm not, I don't believe it would create much in the way of affordability, uh, but in terms of availability, it, it could potentially make a big difference. So actually it's one of the things I've been thinking about and I have some new connections to uh, uh, credit union and banking, and I've actually put that question out there for them. You know, what's what's the real problem? Uh, you've got people with money. You've got people who want to invest. We've got a community need. What's standing in the way outside of some outdated uh, regulations and, and the way uh, uh, banks and credit unions uh, rate loans today? Uh, so we're looking at a lot of things uh, related to how do you change that reality for uh, inclusion. Uh, and diversity, I think this is this comes under that same rubric and not something obviously that the planning commission can tackle, but it might be something that the city might be able to take a look at. Uh, how do we how do we approach uh, people who have the ability to be able to develop those uh, those mortgage instruments that would that would make this happen? And their construction loans that's missing. Yeah, um, interestingly, the um, arch are. Housing, you know, our housing group uh, convenes a, a, a staff working group to talk about different things. And ADUs uh, was the topic, the main topic about a year and a half ago. And this very thing came up that financing is a, a significant problem. Um, and so uh, trying to generate more interest in uh, doing the kinds of loans that could finance an ADU uh, was brought up and, and Arch staff at one point had indicated that that was something that they, you know, they were having some conversations about. So it's really, that's really um, timely uh, feedback. Uh, the other thing I might say is that this is one of the advantages of the whole duplex idea. Triplex maybe, but definitely duplex which I believe my understanding is that for duplex uh, construction, you can get that kind of financing. Don't ask me why, don't ask me what the difference is, but that duplex financing is easier to get uh, and might have a similar outcome. So I just pass that along for what yeah. it's worth. I think you know, I don't I, want to take up the time now, but that's a discussion we may want to have uh, in one of our regular meetings. Uh, just. How, how do we fill that need and how do we fill that gap? Uh, are there conversations a city could have with, with, uh, with appropriate finance, people who have the investment dollars, uh, who, could, who could fill that gap? I got you know, I don't know who that might be. Along those lines, I, I read something, I, I apologize, I don't remember exactly where I read it, but the basic idea was that uh, for ADUs, if you could split the ownership, so in other words, the people who own the main property are owners of that property, but the ADUs would have separate ownership, which would specifically address what Mike's talking about, uh, ability to 
to finance. And I, it might've been um, something related to, you know, um, Seattle, I, I'm sorry, I don't recall exactly where, but that, that idea, uh, you know, might be something new. Yeah. That's but way I beyond the, obviously the planning the, commission's, you know, purview, but it was an idea that, that um, you know, might get to the financing issue a little bit. Yeah. There is a, I won't call it a loophole, but there is a, there is a, a useful part of the condominium uh, rules within state regulation. Essentially, you can build an ADU uh, and you can treat the house and the ADU essentially as the way you would a condominium. So there's separate ownership uh, of the units, uh, but they're on the same lot. You don't have to go through the subdivision rules. So there's some ways to do that. Banks will look at that potentially if there's a separate ownership, uh, that's much more attractive to them. Yeah. And under current uh, loan rating rules, uh, that'll pass. Whereas an ADU, uh, standard ADU might not, even though it's the same property, it's the same right. owner. Yeah. So there's, I mean, there's just some antiquated uh, rules here about how you rate properties and rate risk, a mortgage risk that needs to be addressed. And some uh, banks and some credit unions are tackling that right now. Um, and I think if we, if the city were want to into, enter into some discussions with those folks, they might find uh, find some interest. The key thing here, though, it, it, it is that there's the mortgage component of this for the house, the main residence, and for the ADU. To, but really, it's the construction loan that the all property owner needs to get in order to build the ADU that doesn't exist yet. Uh, banks and traditional financing folks shy away from. Uh, construction loans, they're, they're, they're higher risk than a mortgage loan. But here we have a situation where I bet you could have some people who are uh, out there right now who'd step up and say, hey, maybe I'll finance that for you, or I'll sign a guarantee that I will buy this property once it's built. Those sorts of arrangements happen in larger financing arrangements for you know, hotels or apartment buildings and whatnot. It could probably, if you had somebody who was willing or able to handle the uh, the administrative coordination of that, uh, it seems like that's a barrier we should be able to get around. I can't speak to the financing aspect of all this, although it does, I know it's important, um, an important component of how this all works. But I did hear in the open house um, something similar to what Mike heard is that people seemed really interested in smaller spaces. Um, I heard that. I feel like multiple times from not just one person. Um, and I felt like I was hearing a lot of interest in, interest in, interest in cottage housing. Like I, people seem very curious about that of all the missing metal housing types I, that came up. I feel like cottage housing that seemed to pique people's curiosity. And I think there might be something, well, I won't, I won't guess, but I think one reason was because it would be easier to make that kind of housing ADA compliant or accessible than perhaps a duplex that might have stairs. I think that was one reason. But I thought that was interesting given how, um, that that was not the easiest conversation for us to have as a planning commission about cottage housing. That we, we had an easier time, I think, talking about the other types. So that was a clue to me that we need to keep going, figure out how to talk about cottage housing. From, from someone who, who thought duplexes were a great idea because so many homes in Kenmore in her in her view are um, kind of dating to the 50s and 60s and are split level and are kind of ready-made for duplexization if that's a word but then I remember you were you were saying that uh, to make that work you need what is it a, uh, you need a firewall and you need separate meters which I think one of your colleagues said was like a huge barrier to converting those existing single family split levels to duplexes. So I didn't, I didn't share that with her, but um, just listen to her idea, but. It might be worth, um, you know, that was a preliminary conversation with the, the uh, development services director. I mean, I could go back and say, what exactly would that mean <laughs> right. for like a split level? I would be yeah, interested like in that. Because I, I, I like that person said, I think I see all of the split levels all over. I live in one and they, they do seem like they're really 
in terms of how they're built, like nicely set up to be able to split them yeah. theoretically. Yeah, I do too. I, I still see that as a very viable, it ought to be a very viable option uh, to subdividing lots into smaller and smaller units and, and putting uh, increasing density in that way. You'd have a smaller impact uh, on the on the neighborhoods where, where they're existing today. I'd be curious to know more about the cost component of that. I would imagine, you know, just circling back, that you would find financing for that uh, to be much more ready, readily available. And I'm not sure what the difference would really be between converting a split level into a duplex versus having a uh, an ADU uh, on the same on the lower level in the same way. Uh, it seems to me to be very much the same thing. So yeah, you got to put in an extra meter and uh, there may be some other rules you have to zoning or you have to take care of, but it doesn't seem like it should be that expensive or prohibitive to making it a reasonable investment for, for a homeowner. My right, business, and I, go ahead. Even if it was expensive, I'm not sure that that would change a policy direction that said this could be a good thing because, you know, as housing types change. I know the building code, for example, uh, is recognizing ADUs and how they can be handled differently uh, from two separate units. And so similarly, a duplex conversion, you know, who knows if, if the policy direction is that we think this is a potentially valuable approach, uh, the policy direction can offer the support and then um, at the same time, other rules can be looked at yeah, yeah. to foster that. Yeah. I don't want to have our December 7th meeting tonight, but one of the concerns in the back of my mind that I think about is we can come up with a lot of different options about how you can use the property. And what I would be fearful of, and I think other people might be, is so you've got a single family home right now. Uh, we take the split level and turn it into two units, and then we put an ADU, detached ADU in the back, and all of a sudden we've got a, we, we've got a triplex uh, on what used to be a single family home, and this is very attractive to investors. Uh, and there could, I think a lot of money would come in to, very quickly to do many of those conversions. Is that, on a policy level, is that something we want? Is that how we want to pursue, or pursue density uh, or any of our other goals, because that would be largely uncontrolled once you, or how do you control that? Uh, once you open those floodgates, this becomes an investment decision. And there's lots of money out there who I think we've we seen, uh, I've seen some uh, write-ups and, and, and some stories about the same thing happening in some California communities. Uh, all of a sudden it becomes densely populated by uh, these multiple uncontrolled design as part of it. Anyway, that's something I think we need to think about in the future. As we go down the road, uh, how, what do we really want to end up with? Is it density, uh, you know, full throttle, um, or is there a different vision uh, for Kenmore? And we might we need to find a way to control that. Yeah, someone I heard in, in the missing middle um, had, I, I think a similar concern about large developers and investors buying up you know, like Mike's example right there and, and what happens to, you know, existing residents in the community and housing prices going up. And I thought that was a pretty articulate um, expression um, there. And speaking of density, uh, maybe uh, some of you, the others of you heard it. Uh, one of the people, one of the, he might've been the person who was talking about the uh, blowing up the brownstones, but I think his view was that Kenmore, you know, doesn't really have great access to transit. So it's really, that's the big challenge for providing density. And I know we've, you know, with this missing middle really tried to focus on those areas that are within, uh, you know, a quarter mile of transit. And, and that certainly makes a lot of sense. But in his view, we just don't have really good enough access to transit at the moment to justify, you know, high levels of density at the, at the moment, even with, you know, things like BRT on the way and Someone I think mentioned the ferry, you know, going to the UW as a maybe longer term possibility, and I, I guess light rail at some maybe some far distant point. But um, so, anyways, that was that, that was what one person's uh, views were on that that I heard. I think that what dovetails with that is a lot of concern I heard of people about parking. 
if you don't have that infrastructure in place and you increase your density, those cars are, are people are going to need their cars uh, to do their commuting and shopping. So those cars are going to have to go somewhere. Uh, they're either going to go underneath the new dense housing or they're going to go on the street. So I think there's a there's a policy decision and a management problem we have to think about as part of our land use. I think I did hear perhaps this person, I didn't hear him say put up brownstones everywhere, but maybe I did hear in one of the rooms, was he talking about the, perhaps the need to bypass this missile, missing middle housing types because yes. it would create even more problems in the future for creating even more density? Was that okay? Yeah. And it yeah. seemed like one concern there was about the traffic infrastructure and that we don't have great infrastructure for moving people around in cars as it is, you know, I think 522 being busy and, and like um, 68th and, and Juanita Drive and 155th being busy, I think, yeah, I did hear that. And you know, I, we don't, we haven't really talked about this at least since I've been on the Planning Commission, but I think that that does speak to the fact that we don't, what we're doing and what we're talking about with housing has to happen in concert with other planning issues like transportation, like I, I do, and <laughs> I feel like more cars is not probably going to be ultimately be a good innovative solution for us. Like we do need to talk, think about more robust forms of public transportation. Um, yeah, and syncing all those things up is going to be a challenge for us. I don't know that we can, you know, how do you, how do you stop moving forward with one because you don't have the other lined up? Um, I'm afraid I have to leave at eight o'clock. So that's oh. just a couple of minutes. So I don't know if that's going to mess up our <laughs> quorum or not. That's okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, don't, don't be sorry, Suzanne, at all. Um, Lori and Debbie, is, I mean, is, we could probably have a you know much longer conversation. Is there anything else that you were really looking for from from us tonight, other than sharing? I think these really really excellent thoughts that we have so far. Um, I think it was just getting some preliminary thoughts and feedback, and that, that um, so that we can sort of think about that as we gather the information for the seventh. But the seventh is definitely it's not that we can't continue this conversation. This is sort of like a preview, if you like, but you wanted to have an initial download soon after the meeting so that those thoughts could be expressed. But there's the intent was certainly to have that larger conversation on the seventh. So why don't we continue it there then? And because I, I don't think we can actually uh, legally continue to meet without Suzanne here, right? So. Um... Yeah. <laughs> well, before we go tonight, can I just say that I thought it was run really well, that staff did a great job, the consultants were great. I was really impressed with how our community showed up and how they spoke about the issues. I thought it was a really wonderful dialogue and I was um, really glad to see the participation and I hope we have um, the same or, or a more robust turnout the next time we talk about this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Uh, anything more uh, before before we leave? All right. Well, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Great. Hey, happy Thanksgiving. Yeah, happy Thanksgiving. Yeah. Thanksgiving. See you all on the 6th. Okay.